I apologize, I have some smaller font and I'm not gonna read all of the, the words on, on every slide and you all are not gonna be able to read them either. Um, so we'll just kind of rip through those. I understand I've got 20 minutes, which isn't a lot of time. I could spend a whole day talking about just a couple of these slides. So uh, uh, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about how the three depth LiDAR base specification is implemented uh, within the National Geospatial Program, National Geospatial Technical Operations Center, which is a mouthful. Um, I work with the National Geospatial Technical Operations Center, or NGTOC. NGTOC is the operational branch of the National Geospatial Program. So, um, reason I'm here today is, is Hope Morgan in, invited me to come out and tell you all a little bit about the specification and, and how we interpret it, how we work with it. So here's, uh, here's an overview of what I'm gonna discuss. So in this graphic we see a 3D elevation program, classified LiDAR point cloud availability. And so this shows thematically which point cloud data we have available in the public domain for everyone in here uh, to download and use. Um, I, I captured a quote here from the 3D Elevation Program webpage, and I'm gonna read this. The primary goal of the 3D Elevation Program is to systematically collect 3D elevation data in the form of light detection and ranging data over the conterminous United States, Hawaii, and the U.S. territories with data acquired over an eight year period. So this is, this is probably one of the more relevant program mission statements. Um, 3DEP is actually many things to many people and um, certainly one of the more important characteristics of the program is that as an acquisition strategy. It's a means to systematically collect data for the country. Um, however, it's certainly a lot more than that, right? Uh, another important mission statement is that we make this data publicly available and that we assure some level of confidence that the data are good. So this graphic uh, shows a national map downloader. I don't know how many of you are familiar with USGS uh, data themes and um, the publicly available data sets that, that are uh, available through this download application. Um, I've expanded uh, the 3D elevation program data theme windows here. It's gonna be hard to see, but basically there's a 3DEP products and a 3DEP source layer. And if you blow those up, the products are really raster specific. So right now our current approach is we, we ingest all of this point cloud data and as well as raster data from contractors. We put it through a QC process and we um, update our seamless digital elevation models, which prior to the inception of 3DEP were known as national elevation data sets. So we have seamless DEM coverage um, across the US, uh, including all outlying territories, a spatial resolution of one third arc second. And that's kind of our flagship um, elevation model, if you will, because it is seamless. And where we have LIDAR data, once it's been validated, we use that LIDAR data, and more accurately, we use finer spatial resolution DEMs coming from the LIDAR data, derived from the LIDAR data, to update the coarser uh, spatial resolution seamless DEMs. So in the, in the bottom graphic there is the, the source layer, and we, we don't, in, in this layout, we don't refer to the LiDAR point cloud as a product, but really it is the most important product for the program. Because we realize that the point cloud is um, of capable of so much more than just making DEMs, right? Um, probably one of the, the primary reasons we don't have the point cloud listed as a product specifically is because it's not something the USGS creates. We get it from contractors. Contractors collect, produce the data, deliver it to us. All right, so within the National Geospatial Technical Operations Center, uh, 
One of our objectives in elevation production is to produce and distribute a standard set of products from non-standard inputs. And so those, those standard products I'm referring to are those DEMs. And the non-standard inputs I'm referring to are the point cloud data and the vector data that, that's correlated. So hydro brake lines, for example. But wait, we have this LiDAR base specification. The intent of that is to assure that we have some level of standardization, right? Yes and no. It, it is intended to do that, and it does a good job in some ways and not so good a job in other ways. And the reason for that is that LiDAR data is just inherently variable. And it varies from project to project. It varies sometimes within projects. And why is that? Right? Um, well, there's a lot of reasons, but we have different hardware, we have different software, we have different um, acquisition strategies, different platforms. So we're taking all these disparate technologies and we're bringing them together, trying to produce standard point cloud data. Um, another reason that the data are different is that 3DEP as a program is intended to integrate the needs of many different partners um, different partnering agencies specifically. So North Carolina's requirements are gonna be very different than FEMA's requirements, are gonna be different than the Forest Service requirements, which are different than the Fish and Wildlife Service's requirements. So in general, the, the point cloud data do differ quite a bit relative to um, maybe other data themes within the USGS. However, we do have this base specification, and we do have a dedicated staff, full-time professionals that work with the data to ensure that it's meeting some minimum level requirements, and that it's minimally consistent from project to project. So here's a, here's a high-level overview of what our data QC team does within the NGTALK Elevation Operations Group. So um, they very carefully read the metadata coming from contractors. There's a LIDAR report, it's basically a mapping report that uh, gets produced and contains a wealth of information, including um, how the positional accuracy is assured, you know, whether it's a relative accuracy component or an absolute accuracy component. Um, they check to make sure the contractors are doing that work they're uh, providing information that, um, that shows that there was some process flow in place to inspect and validate the data for positional accuracy. And that's actually a requirement in the LiDAR base specification um, that, that this reporting be provided. They uh, basically rip the header of every LAS file and they break it down into a database, um, inspect it for consistency, make sure all the attribution is proper, and um, that's, that's um, the LASQC bullet there. Uh, they look at the well-known text court, which, which contains a coordinate reference system for the, um, all the point cloud data, and I put a asterisk there because it's basically a blob of text and some, some codes, some EPSG codes, but that particular, um, Characteristic of the data is, it accounts for a disproportionate amount of issues that our QC folks have to deal with. Of course, they do absolute vertical accuracy test on the data, which is very straightforward. You know, it's basically triangulating the point cloud and then comparing the, the vertical of that tin facet to the horizontal coordinate or position of the ground truthing data. And they also check the, uh, the DEMs that are provided as well to make sure those are meeting our vertical accuracy requirements. Uh, there is a raster deliverables for the program as well. Um, they, they check the raster files similarly to how they check the point cloud. They rip the header information, make sure the header's good. Um, there's uh, different metadata uh, associated with the data deliverables for the program. They review those. And then they do a lot of hands-on kind of in the weeds inspection of the data. So they're pulling the point cloud data up in different software packages, they're reviewing it for completeness, making sure there's no glaring um, issues with it. And um, as far as classification accuracy of the bare earth and 
subsequent, or I should say related classes for the uh, purpose of creating the DEMs, they um, do a manual review of the DEM. So they're literally at a specific mapping scale panning through the entire project, and we have multiple technical staff doing this to make sure that the, the DEMs are basically aesthetically good, right? There's no, there's no glaring issues. So I'm definitely talking a little bit too long on these slides. I'm gonna have to pick up the pace because I only have uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, so as far as looking at the goodness of fit and the, the positional integrity of the data, these um, delta Z, Z delta separation rasters, whatever you want to call them, they're basically intensity rasters, rasters based on the intensity of the point cloud data that are modulated by color uh, or with, with color based on the vertical separation from flight line to flight line. This is a really good way to look holistically at your point cloud data and make sure it's good, that there's no um, you know, gross error and uh, flight line to flight line alignment. However, this is a SWAT specific tool, right? It doesn't work when you have an aggregate model point cloud like you do with, with um, Geiger mode LiDAR data sets, um, which, which is a technology that North Carolina has been using for a while now. And so with, with Geiger mode point cloud data, can't perform this same kind of assessment because there is no flight line to flight line um, information within the point cloud. Um, so yeah, in addition to looking at these rasters kind of holistically, they can, they can use these to pinpoint areas of concern and spot check the, the actual point cloud data to see if there's any, any problem there with um, the flight line to flight line alignment. So here are some uh, graphics showing that DEM review process. It's really, really basic. You know, if you if you look at a shaded relief raster or a, a tin model of the DEM, it reveals a lot in the surface characteristics. And if there are problems either with classification, which we see in that blue graphic where the where the points are all blue, um, we have a, I think that's a triangulated model, and those bridge decks were left in the ground surface. So. That's a problem, that's, that's not a accurate DEM. Um, they would either, uh, they being our QC folks, sorry, uh, they would either um, flag those for um, information to send back to the contractor or fix them internally. Um, here in the upper right we see there's a, there's a vertical bust, you can see there's a linear feature there and so I'm not quite sure if that's a, if that's a, a temporal issue, maybe there's a water, uh, maybe that's a marshy area and there was water that was captured in, in one scan and missing in an adjacent scan or if that's just a, a tile edge artifact or calibration bust or something like that. And of course, misclassification of the ground surface. So we have vegetation left in the ground class and it's very evident in the surface. You can see a lot of bumpy texture there. Uh, so, an important part of the 3 dep DEM uh, data product suite is that the uh, certain hydro features have to be treated. They have to be brake line enforced. So uh, here we have um, a water body that was brake line enforced, but for whatever reason, the elevation of that water body was, was um, higher than it should be. And so you can see the water looks to be floating in that left image. And then after correction, it's down at a more reasonable level. And I should say the, the purpose of hydro treatment for 3 dep DEMs at this point, it's purely aesthetic. It really is, it's, it's all about producing a cartographic product. There is no hydro modeling associated with these brake lines or the DEMs themselves. The DPMs are, or DEMs are really for a topographic product at this point. And so there are some exciting developments within the National Geospatial Program as far as integrating our hydrography data set data theme and our elevation data theme because the, the LiDAR derived elevation data is far more accurate spatially than, than anything we have with our, our uh, hydrographic uh, program. And so if we can take the attribution of our hydrographic program, integrate with the positional integrity of our elevation data, we're gonna have much better data. Um, I mentioned that, that coordinate reference system header uh, issue where 
um, we basically have uh, all these different software packages. You recall me saying there's a lot of variability in how the data are produced. We have different contractors using different software. The software all treats the coordinate reference system information differently. Um, here we have a situation where Blue Marble transformation engine uh, calls uh, these two parameters central meridian and latitude of origin. GDAL, which is open source vector editing and um, data library, um, has different terminology. Latitude of center, longitude of center. This simple syntax discrepancy causes a whole process to come to a screeching halt. And it's really frustrating. And so here we have the, uh, the EPSG website, EPSG being the, uh, the authority on, on global coordinate reference systems. They have something entirely different. So the values, the, the, the latitude and longitude are identical, 23, negative 96 longitude, but because we have different words in there, it causes the software to fail. So it's really frustrating, but it's unfortunately what we're stuck with at this point, because all of our data have to be machine readable. So it's really important that coordinate reference system information be embedded in the files properly. There's no way I'm gonna read all this, and I don't expect you guys to, and I'm, Getting a little bit short on time, so I'm gonna rip through this. this uh, the next two slides show basically what's new in LiDAR Base Spec 1.3, which really isn't so new. Uh, this came out about a year ago. Yeah, I was gonna talk through these, but clearly mistimed this. So um, I'm gonna highlight a couple things that are new. One is there's a requirement to report the positional, the horizontal accuracy of the data. And it references an ASPRS equation, and it's a really conservative equation, and it's a little flawed. It's better than what we had before, which is nothing, but it really doesn't tell us a whole lot about the horizontal accuracy. So why is that? Well, for the reasons I have in bullets there, it doesn't account for, the equation doesn't account for all of these things, and if anyone wants to talk more about this, I'd be happy to. All right. Um, no longer need swaths. So again, for North Carolina and their Geiger mode data, there is no swath data to begin with, uh, at least none that would be, um, can be intelligently interpreted by, by any of us in the room. So uh, for conventional linear mode LiDAR systems, there's no requirement to, to deliver swath data anymore. This, again, this has been the case now for any project that's been using this new LiDAR base spec for the last year or so. Um, but in, in lieu of having the actual SWAT data, the USGS requires there be some spatial feature that shows the delineation of the SWATs themselves. So um, we can tie the spatial extent of a SWAT or a flight line, a scan of LiDAR data back to the information that's in the tiled form. And of course there's a requirement for attribution within the SWAT polygons. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about interpreting the LiDAR base specification because remember at the beginning I mentioned that the LiDAR base spec enables us some assurance that the data are good, but it's, it's only a minimum requirement of characteristics. We can't, we can't ensure there's consistency in, in, in all regard, or regarding every component of the point cloud data from project to project. And so here we have uh, a situation where North Carolina has this really, really rich uh, Geiger mode LiDAR data set, you know, very uh, dense, um, a lot of detail, a lot of fidelity in a point cloud. And North Carolina is okay with uh, automated building classification. Now automated building classification does a pretty good job, but doesn't do a great job. And because it's automated and there's no, there's no human time, there's no eyes on the data, manual editing the data, there's a lot of misclassification. And so we have buildings and we have vegetation that are misclassified. See the, the, the red points are building classified points, the green are vegetation classified points. We have sides of buildings that are classified as vegetation. That's not right. So in the specification, we have this language that additional classes may be required. And then we have this bullet that all points not identified as withheld shall be properly classified shall be properly classified. So it's, it's basically stating it has to be done, right? Well, our folks doing the validation of this struggle because they know it's not required. Right now, the program doesn't have any specification for needing buildings or vegetation, but the fact that they're classified in this data set presents a problem. How do we handle this within the USGS? Do we, 
Do we just disregard that these data are misclassified? So it's it's, it's topic of, of conversation right now. Um, another misclassification, we have buckshot. This is uh, basically sensor crosstalk from the Geiger mode system. Um, it's, it's, for those of you that are familiar with, with uh, imagery, it's analogous to maybe um, blooming in, um, in imagery where you have basically saturated signal and a detector um, can't handle it. So we have this uh, artifact we're calling buckshot. Buckshot really should be classified as noise and tagged as withheld or, or at least classified as noise so that it's not, it's not considered a viable data point. In this case, data are classified as vegetation as part of the process. And so it, it does present a problem. Um, wasn't sure if Hope was going to be in here, so I, I put these slides in here for her. But, but here is, uh, you know, we can tie the buckshot artifact back to intensity. There's a correlation. Uh, we were able to identify it by um, creating these fine spatial resolution intensity images at about a one foot uh, ground sample distance. And, and you can see there um, where these, these artifacts exist. So um, by and large, the data are good, but we do have these anomalies in the Geiger mode data. All right, so wrapping up, um, here's a, a list of some very important uh, documents. So of course we have the base spec, and then within the base spec we reference these other standards. And so if you're interpreting the base specification, it's really good to have these links handy and um, know where to find them. So that's it. That's a, that's a picture of our elevation operations team outside of our Rolla, Missouri office. So NG Talk is, is basically one center split between two offices, one in Denver and one in Rolla, Missouri. And um, a lot of our QC is done in the Rolla, Missouri office. But this is everyone from Denver and Rolla. Fortunately, I missed that trip, so I'm not in the picture. So, thank you. Yes, Doug. You mentioned the Google software. Uh, are you aware of the, the uh, SRS farm raising and the upgrading of Podge, the Podge 6? Yeah. How do you think that will work? I sure hope so. I really do. Because it's Podge 4 now, right? That's what we're using. Podge 5 has been out for a while. Uh, Podge 6 is going to go completely. Do I think it's I heard five has been out, but I don't know that, I know we haven't implemented it. I know a lot of the applications we use are still referencing Proj4, I believe, which could be. It takes everything to WGS 84, then out. Proj5 and Proj6 will allow you to go directly to different agencies. You know, that'll be good, but the main issue is will it still, will we still have this discrepancy from one CRS to the next, or, or within a CRS, depending on the application that's used to encode the file. Well, everyone started using their software, so, so it may just take the place of, of the other implementation. Yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. Well, I know once we, we and this is a, another dis discussion topic, but of course, NatRIF 2022, mm -hmm. Nat83 is going away, and so that's going to create a whole um, slew of problems for everyone, right? Because the transformation to get to NARA 2022 is going to be very extensive. It's, but NGS is on top of that. They're doing a good job with NADCON development. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to do that. But any other questions? All right, thank you everyone.